Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight, I'm beginning a new series, and the topic is Early Church Heresies. I expect this will probably take several sessions to get through them all, even though uh, I'm going to try to race through them as much as possible. Uh, this is kind of related to the studies I've been doing uh, the last few months on early church history and church, church creeds. Um, so it didn't take long at all for heresies to enter the church. Now, people today, they want to, uh, uh, you know, so call something heresy. And there certainly are heresies live and well today. Uh, but we are warned about heresies coming into the church early in the scriptures. And uh, I, let me start by just saying that if we look at Ecclesiastes, we're also told in Ecclesiastes 1.9, it says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Well, I've noticed for a long time that uh, a lot of the heresies that we, we discuss here on YouTube uh, today that are, you know, modern day problems, um, we can see them mentioned in the scriptures. And so these heresies are not, for the most part, these heresies are not uh, inventions of the last, last year, last 10 years, even last 50 years. They can be traced back to even the days of the apostles and, and in the second and third centuries, we see these things have cropped up. Uh, now, I'm going to go through them, and um, then let's see if these old, these old heresies uh, are still existing today. That's the question I want to keep asking throughout this study. Uh, first of all, let me... Awful re re also reference uh, 2 Peter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So this is in Second Peter, and of course this was this was written uh, in the first century. Uh, we were warned there that there were not only false teachers teaching heresies at that time, but in the future there would be more to come. Um, it's, it says here in this uh, essay I'm looking at, it says the apostle accurately observed the spread of heresy in the first century church and his warning that false teachers would continue to arise can easily be seen in the growth of cults and pseudo-Christian religions in our time. Interestingly, the heresies that are popular today are simply variations of the same heresies that have arisen throughout the history of the church. Uh, so we're going to examine these ancient heresies and then see if we can identify the, that they still exist today in, in some form that you may be uh, familiar with. But um, there's, there are a couple of terms here that I think might be helpful also. Uh, there was a term called proto-Orthodox. Uh, historians have used this term. It refers to... Um, the positions that were general or official acceptance before they became what called orthodox. In other words, they were before orthodox and then were later established as this is the orthodox viewpoint. Uh, and then you had uh, other positions that were called heterodox, which were contrary to orthodox. Now, heterodox is kind of a polite way of saying heresy. <laughs> so, um, I don't mind using the word heresy. I know that here on YouTube, 
Uh, it's not uncommon for people to throw the, uh, that word around quite um, liberally. And uh, I, I believe that uh, if we look at the word heresy to mean, to mean non-orthodox, now what is orthodox? Uh, or, orthodox is the normally accepted viewpoint by, let's say, the consensus. And throughout uh, church history, uh, when arguments arose about, you know, what is the correct position, and you had various factions, they would generally have a council, discuss it, and then write a creed to establish what they said was orthodox. Now, if you're outside of that orthodox, to the right or the left of it, uh, then you were heterodox, you're not orthodox. Um, now, uh, if you if you examine all your theological positions today, I, I have a video titled Test for Dogmatists. And in that I ask maybe 20 questions about the theology. And I say true or false on each one. Now, if you were to go to that video and answer each one of those questions, and then if you were to compare your answers with all your best friends, um, uh, I find it highly unlikely that uh, your, your questions are going to completely coincide with your friends, even though these are people that you trust and believe they're truly Christians and uh, you have fellowship with them. If you really examine all the theological questions, none of us are going to be in a complete agreement. So what are we going to do when we disagree? Well, part of my creed or, or, or uh, or a uh, slogan is in uh, essentials unity. We must agree. We must be unified on the essentials, and the essentials pertain to the person of Jesus, who He is, and the means of salvation. How do we get saved? So we've got to agree on that, and then uh, uh, all other theological subjects uh, apart from that. Uh, I don't believe that they rise to the level of being called damnable heresy, even though you might say, well, your position is not orthodox, it's out of the mainstream. Uh, it doesn't qualify you as being a damnable heretic, even though we might be able to call it hero, heterodox, it's not orthodox. Uh, and, and it's a polite way of saying, well, that viewpoint is heresy. Um, I think if you examined every one of my theological views, you might find a few of those and you say, well, that's that's heresy, that's not orthodox. And I say, well, I guess I'm guilty. I'm not complete orthodox in every every way. But orthodox is just um, a word for the majority opinion. And I, I don't think any of us should just say the majority is always right. I mean, after all, <laughs> look at the, major, the majority viewpoint in the whole world. The majority of the world don't even identify themselves as Christian of any kind. And then if we look at the, let's say, the one third of the world's population that call themselves Christian, if you were to examine their uh, doctrines, you'd find out that the majority of them uh, believe that salvation comes by good works rather than by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. So uh, if you're if you're going to just go with the majority all the time, then uh, you're going to be really uh, failing in in. Uh, Veritas and the truth of, of what the Bible really says. Um, so I'm I'm not so worried about what we would call just heresy, but I would very much be concerned on what we call would call damnable heresy. Damnable heresy is you're wrong to in, in a particular way that will make you go to hell. And if you teach other people, then uh, you're leading others to hell because it's a damnable heresy you're teaching. So as we go through these, keep these things in mind. And there's another part of this little essay I looked at here. Um, it, it says that uh, there has probably never been a Christian whom some other Christian at some period would not have considered to be a heretic. <laughs> so, so I just... Um, I think that we need to stand up for uh, the core doctrines of Christianity. Uh, in, in essentials, we must be unified and defend it. 
And if someone cannot agree that Jesus is eternal God Almighty, manifest in the flesh as the Son of God, and salvation is a free gift offered to everyone, uh, and we receive the gift of salvation through faith alone in Christ alone, and that we can never lose salvation once we've received it. If we, you cannot agree with these basic core doctrines of Christianity, then I'd say, cursed be gone. You cannot be in fellowship because that's damnable heresy. Uh, however, if we examine all your theological positions, we might find that in some ways you have some other heresies, just as you might say, in some way I have other heresies. So in, in essentials, let's have unity. In non-essentials, let's have liberty. Let's be show grace to each other on the non-essential subjects. Uh, but in all things, grace and love and charity for each other. Okay, so... Um, let's look at the, the earliest heresy that we find in the scriptures, and I think probably the most serious. These are the Judaizers, and we see them in the very first century, right in the beginnings of the church. <clears throat> Judaizers, or the Judaizing movement, is not a condemnation of Judaism or ethnic Jews. <clears throat> Instead, it has historically been the label for those who attempt to make observing the Mosaic law a requirement for Christianity and salvation. The book of Acts refers to such people as they of the circumcision. If we look at Acts 10, 45 and 11, 2, this is, these are uh, scriptures that point that out. And the council at Jerusalem decisively ruled against them in Acts chapter 15. Um, despite this biblical ruling, the Judaizing movement continued to, to draw, to grow in our time. These movements require such things as strict observance of the Sabbath uh, or on Saturday, mandatory tithing, observance of the Jewish feasts, and other regulations in order for a Christian to earn salvation. Now, I've, I've talked a lot about the problem of Judaizing or legalism uh, in many of my videos. I have a, a playlist called uh, titled... Uh, Paul onlyism uh, debunked, and another um, another playlist uh, titled um, co "Comparing." Uh, no, it's not comparing. It's uh, shocking facts about James and Paul, the disagreement. So, if you go to those playlists, you'll see a great in-depth. And if you look at the first few videos in my series early church history. You'll see a very clear, uh, for hours and hours, I go into greater detail. I'm only going to just barely touch on it tonight. But Judaizing is really could be broadly stated as legalizing uh, or legalism. And that is the argument that Paul wanted to correct. And he said that do not try to mix grace uh, and law or grace and works because they are mutually exclusive. Uh, see, uh, grace actually means no works. It's completely by the grace of God, no works. And law means you, it's got to be done by the law, no grace. So you cannot have them together. They clash, they, they annul each other. Uh, so that's the whole point of Paul writing the book of Galatians is to point out that the church, the early church was wrong in Jerusalem. Uh, in James and in the Bible calls them the men from James. Uh, they were going to the churches that Paul had started and, and they were going and saying that, wait, what Paul's telling you is wrong. It's not faith alone in Christ alone. It's, it's a, you've got to follow Judaism. So this problem of um, people believing that faith in Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's done for us, that he is uh, God manifest in the flesh, he uh, became a man named Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and so that he could die for our sins, and he raised from the dead so he proved who he is and his claims were true. Well, faith in Jesus and what he did is not enough. It's insufficient. You must also get circumcised. 
you must follow the, the dietary laws. You've got to follow the commandments. And maybe you have to follow all 613 of the Mosaic laws. You see, and then you've got to go to the temple and you've got to continue making sacrifices at the temple. See, these were the things that these Judaizers were coming into Paul's churches and saying, faith alone, Christ alone. No, that's not enough. You got to still practice all this religion. Uh, so Paul, Paul's primary mission was, was correcting that error of the Judaizers, showing us that, uh, no, uh, religion of any kind, works of any kind are just filthy rags and they, 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 they ruin salvation, that you don't not attain salvation through any kind of religious works. And the book of Hebrews, which I believe Paul did write, that he also uh, explains in the book of Hebrews that, wait, it's Jesus did everything. Don't, don't try to keep on doing sacrifices. He made his sacrifice on the cross was one final sacrifice for all time. Don't continue doing your animal sacrifices because you are, uh, you're, uh, uh, you're, you're crucifying Christ all over again. So the idea of Judaizing, uh, we see uh, in, the, in the epistles, and it's still here today. The biggest problem in the church today that I see here on YouTube and all across America, and I'm assuming it's true all over the world, is that people are trying to mix grace and works together. And that's what Ju the Judaizers were doing. So this is a, this is a damnable heresy because um, if you try to add to the grace of God, if you add works to it, you've frustrated, you've nullified it, you've made it of none effect. So now let's look at the, uh, now who does, who, is, who are the Judaizers today? Well, in terms of uh, worshiping on the Sabbath, we got the seventh day Adventists that are insisting upon that. I'm not sure that they uh, insist upon it for your salvation. I don't think that's correct, but they are saying that the Sabbath uh, worshiping on Saturday rather than Sunday must be observed. And yeah, you've got uh, uh, pretty much Roman Catholics uh, insisting that you follow all these religious rules and regulations and and uh, must also have a works accompanying your faith. Um, you've got Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, all of these different uh, uh, cults, uh, false forms of Christianity. They are all have an element of Judaizers in them or legalism. The next one I want to look at is Marcionism. And this uh, took place in the second century, named after someone named Marcion. Um, he lived from 85 to 160 AD. <clears throat> and his viewpoint was that the wrathful and warlike God of the Old Testament is a different God from the just and, and forgiving God of the New Testament who on discovering human suffering appeared as Jesus Christ to bring salvation. Uh, the Old Testament is irrelevant. And uh, it, in the New Testament, only parts of Luke and parts of Pauline letters are authentic. So Marcion, he was really kind of the first guy to uh, develop a canon of, of scriptures. Now, the word canon, a lot of times, we use the word canon to refer to the Bible, the books in the Bible that are accepted as, as uh, scripture. We've got 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, and we say this is our canon our, of, uh, in the, of scripture. Canon just means uh, it, is, it has been deemed and, and ruled it is the correct, uh, the acceptable. But uh, throughout history, the church councils have come up with all kinds of canons and not, not to, to tell us which scriptures are correct, but just which ruling. A canon really is just a ruling by a council and set a decree. It's like if our Congress or Senate get together and they present a bill and say, oh, let's all vote on this bill and they approve it, that, would, that bill would be put into effect. Well, that's what a canon is in terms of... Uh, church history and, and church councils. Uh, but the canon of scripture is different. And these are the books that we consider to be uh, the word of God. Marcion rejected all of the Old Testament because he viewed the, 
Testament was not the same God. It's kind of like the God of the Old Testament is, is, is uh, the devil. It's not what he said, but in, in my eyes, I see that he says that person is evil in the Old Testament. It's not the same God. Uh, and the, then the God of the New Testament is loving and merciful. And uh, so he, is, he said the only books that should be accepted are none of the Old Testament books and any book in the New Testament that had any Judaism in it at all should be discarded. So he only accepted uh, of the four gospel accounts, he only accepted Luke uh, and because Luke was a Gentile. And then uh, he, he accepted Paul's letters, but only 10. I'm not sure which 10, but uh, 10 of the, the 13. Uh, a lot of people think that there's 12 books Paul wrote, but uh, I believe he wrote uh, Hebrews, so I would say 13. Um, but uh, Marcion said only 10 of Paul's books were canon and that even in those books he went through and edited anything that was uh, mentioned judaism was favorable to towards judaism so he's very anti-jewish anti-old testament and he thought that uh everything from that was evil um it is my notes here say this is heretical in part because it denies the unity of god uh you know the Jesus is the God of the old of the New Testament and the Old Testament. He is eternal God Almighty. Uh, I've discussed a lot the, the Godhead, the, the 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 triunity of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, uh, th three persons but one God. It's the same God that's in the Old Testament as the New Testament, and the God of the Old Testament is not evil. Um, he does a lot of merciful, wonderful things too in the Old Testament, but people just want to emphasize the things that are uh, that they would deem as, oh, God must be evil because he's done this or that. Um, it, it also, it misunderstands the humanity of, of, of Christ uh, because that he believed that everything physical was evil. Uh, so Christ couldn't have any humanity. Uh, it, and it rejects certain scriptures. Uh, Marcion rejected all the scriptures except for the book of Luke and the letters of Paul, to whom he considered himself an intellectual su successor. Uh, he was excommunicated as few as four years after his conversion to Christianity, rejecting nearly all forms of Christianity but his own. Marcion attracted a sufficient following to cause concern among more mainstream Christians and his lasting influence on many Christian communities was nearly one of the influences that led the establishment of the Nicene Creed. Um, now, do we have any of these Marcionists today? Uh, well, I, I encounter people sometimes who uh, tell me that the same kind of thing Marcion taught, that the God, God of the Old Testament is an evil God. They don't believe in that God. They only believe in the God of the New Testament. So I still see that it's not a real prominent, it's probably more prominent among, among non-believers like atheists. They want to point out to us that how evil the God of the Old Testament is. So, uh, but, but they're not Christians. Uh, there, there are not that many Christians I know that, that see it that way, but there are a few. Um, now let's look at docetism. Docetism, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, can't really say for sure if it started in the first or, but it, it was, I think it could be found between the first and the fourth centuries. Uh, and the name is taken from the Greek word dokin, which equals to seem. In other words, it only seems that way. It's not the reality. The docetists believe that the seeming humanity of Christ, particularly his suffering, were imaginary. They taught that the divine God cannot suffer and thus since Christ is divine, his suffering was an illusion to teach humans a valuable lesson about the illusion of matter. Doc docetism was an integral part of Gnosticism. Uh, I think Gnosticism came after docetism. It was kind of an offspring of it. Uh, the heresy was a major impetus for the Chalcedonian definition of 451, which describes that Christ is one person with two natures, human and divine. Uh, the heresy continues among modern groups that deny the reality of suffering. 
Well, basically what it is really telling us is that, um, uh, again, this springs from the idea that the material world is evil. Um, and this can even be traced back to Platonism. And uh, they, because they believe the material world is evil, uh, Jesus could not possibly have had any material quality to him. And material quality means the flesh, bones, blood, humanity. So he, he only appeared to be human. Uh, it was an illusion. Uh, but the problem with that is that if he was not a really flesh and blood and not truly human, then that means he did not really suffer and die on the cross. And our, our salvation is based on the fact that he suffered and died on the cross for our sins. So with docetism, we would not have any uh, salvation, no propitiation. Um, and we would have no resurrection. So when we see in the scriptures, when it talks about those people who deny the resurrection, these people are uh, probably docetists uh, because they deny that there was a bodily resurrection of Jesus. Not only bodily resurrection, they just denied the bodily incarnation of Jesus entirely. But we can see that uh, now, are there any people today that you can think of that would d deny the reality of the material world? Uh, uh, that are some sect of Christianity. Um, none come to my mind, really, but... All right, if you think of one, uh, let me know. Uh, now, let's look at uh, 1 John, I mean, uh, John 1, 1 through 3. Oh, well, that refutes it. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, uh, and, and so on. And the word became flesh and lived among us. So that, that clearly refutes it. Um, Philippians 2, 6 through 8. I'm not sure what that says. Let me look it up very quickly here. And it says, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in a fashion as, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So these are verses that refute docetism. Now, um, some of the uh, religions that they point out that uh, would maybe embrace docetism, this viewpoint are Christian science, uh, mind scientists, the New Age movement. But in none of these religions really, I, I would say, are really even considered to be some sect of Christianity. The next one we want to look at is Gnosticism. And a lot of people believe that uh, Gnosticism preceded Jesus. Uh, but I, I think now, uh, now that with more archaeological discoveries uh, that we've made, we've, uh, the Nag Hammadi scrolls, and most people now have concluded that Gnosticism came after Jesus. Not, it, wasn't, didn't, it was not a precursor. Uh, but uh, it's, it's named for the Greek gnosis, uh, or, which means knowledge. Now, a good way to understand it, I think, is to look at the, the word... Um, agnostic now you have a, a a believer someone who believes god exists that's who i am i believe in god i'm a believer um, and then you have um, someone who does not believe in god uh, that, that we call them atheists uh, no theism a means no there is no god and then you have Gnostic is someone who has knowledge. So agnostic means you don't have knowledge. So if someone is an agnostic, they're just saying, well, you're asking me, is, does God exist? Well, I don't know. 
I don't have any knowledge to prove it or not. And I'm not undecided. Um, but a Gnostic is someone who says, I do have knowledge. So the Gnostics were the people who believed they had knowledge. In fact, they believed that they had more knowledge than anybody else. They had secret knowledge. And there's a, there's a lot to this, but it's based upon uh, you get saved not through faith in Jesus. or and, and, and The only way you're getting saved is by acquiring the secret knowledge, and then you can graduate to certain levels of, of salvation or heaven uh, through acquiring more knowledge. Um, now, let's see. Um, it says here the... Uh, this is part of the, uh, the, the, the story, the, let's call it a creation story that they have, the Gnostic says, our world was created not by the true God, but by a lesser one called the Demiurge. I've also heard Plato use that term too. So I think uh, so this comes from Platonism, this whole idea, the Demiurge, uh, a kind of divine craftsman whose creation of the mundane world or this reality wor world here, uh, was essentially something of a mistake. So creation of the material world was a mistake done by this demiurge. Uh, humans have a spark of divinity, however. The realm of the true God is concealed for humans, but there is secret knowledge which can enable some human souls to return to it. Um, uh, the knowledge was secretly transmitted by Jesus to the select few. Um, so what the Gnostics taught, and there are a lot of books that are uh, uh, not in the Bible because they were considered to be Gnostic books. They, they believed in Gnosticism and then they wrote a, an account and most of the time these were deemed to be uh, uh, pseudonyms where they, they claimed it was written by a particular apostle but it wasn't. They just took their name to try to get credibility for the book that they wrote. Um, so these Gnostic books are not in the Bible for a reason because they're teaching this kind of, you know, false, uh, you know, theology. It is. It doesn't agree with the scriptures at all. So you can't have books in the Bible. They're absolutely contradicting everything else we learn in the Bible. So they are not what we call non-canonical books, not in the Bible. And they're not in it for good reason. Um, uh, a little bit more about it. it says this is heretical in part because God created everything, including people. Uh, it wasn't the Demiurge uh, that created things; it was God Himself. Uh, Jesus did not transmit any secret knowledge. Uh, the means for salvation are freely available for the public teachings and openly performed sacraments of the church. Well, this is where I disagree with this particular writer. He says that uh, through sacraments, we're not uh, saved through any kind of sacraments at all. Uh, the Gnostics promoted three basic teachings. Matter is evil, and thus Jesus only appeared to be a man. Uh, I should say it this way. Jesus only appeared to be a man. Because Point two, because the Bible teaches that God created matter, the God of the Old Testament Jews is an evil deity who is distinct from the New Testament God, Jesus Christ. And point three, ultimate truth is a mystery that is available only to those who are initiated into the secret teachings and practices of the Gnostic groups. So you can see here that Marcionism, Gnos uh, Docetism, and Gnosticism are kind of inter intertwined in their uh, philosophy. It says, Gnosticism has become popular in the latter half of the 20th century with the 1945 Egyptian discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library, a collection of Gnostic writings. One of the most influential books in the modern Gnosticism has been Elaine Pagel's The Gnostic Gospels, an analysis of the Nag Hammadi documents. Modern Gnosticism is commonly found in syncretistic groups, which teach that truth can be found by combining the beliefs and practices of numerous religions. Uh, the heretical theory that salvation comes through some special kind of knowledge, usually knowledge claimed by a special elite group, 
Gnostic theories existed before Christianity. Yeah, the theories did, uh, uh, going back to, to Plato. Uh, and the Gnostics adapted the Gospels to their own views and for their own purposes, even composing pseudo-Gospels. This is what I mentioned earlier. Embodying their particular ideas and doctrines, Gnosticism held matter to be evil and hostile to the human spirit. Uh, so there's a lot of verses that we can cite that refute it. Uh, I don't want to go through all those verses, but it's pretty, pretty simple to refute it. Uh, most of the, uh, I would not say that any of uh, the uh, common uh, denominations or sects of Christianity hold to this even though some of them may have a little bit of Gnosticism built into it, but really it's much more prominent and uh, uh, prevalent in, in the New Age movement. The next thing I want to discuss is called adoptionism. And uh, adoptionism, um, it says, held that Jesus was not really God, but merely a man to whom special graces had been given and who achieved a kind of divine status at his baptism. Uh, this idea that Christ as a man was only the adopted son of God proved to be a persistent heresy. Uh, who, uh, Theodotus is someone uh, who has promoted this. Uh, uh, and the same heresy was condemned uh, was condemned several times throughout church history. Um, but think about adoptionism. Um, if you're someone who has heard the gospel and then you believed in Jesus and received salvation, then you are referred to as a child of God. Now, as a male, I would be called a son of God. If you're watching now and you're a female, you would be called a child of God or a daughter of God. Now, Jesus is also referred to as the son of God. And the son of God or the only begotten son of God is a distinction from, from the type of son of God that I am. I am a son of God through adoption. That's what the scriptures tell us, that we are adopted. But but this heresy that Jesus is adopted is a little bit different, even though the term is the same as we find in the Bible regarding those of us who are believers. They're basically saying that Jesus was just a, a normal man like everybody else, but he was so good, he was able to do what none of us could do. He lived a perfect life. And because he never sinned, he reached a status that made him kind of a demigod or a uh, a, a god with a little g, kind of like you, you find in the uh, the Jehovah Witness Bible, where it says, uh, "In the beginning was was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was a God." Instead of it doesn't say, "And the Word was God." They say, "The Word was a God with a little g." Uh, so when you have God with a little g, it means that you're He's not eternal, God Almighty. He's still a creature. So the problem with adoptionism is Jesus is a man, so he's a creature. And he only received kind of a semi-God status because he lived such a, a, a perfect life. Um, now, I can't really think of uh, anybody, maybe, maybe the New Age religions would believe in that, but I don't know anybody in Christendom today who believes in, in that uh, viewpoint of Jesus. Um, the next one we'll look at is called Manichaeism, and it was this was found in the third century. Um, it says, the world is caught in a conflict between the forces of good and evil led by two gods, a conflict which has existed since the beginning of time. So does this sound familiar? Uh, it, it's sounding a, like, a lot like um, the first one we looked at, which was um, uh, not the first one, the second one, Marcionism. The idea that everything in the Old Testament is evil. There's an evil God that's not the same God as the God of the Bible. I mean, God of the New Testament. 
Um, so this Manichaeanism, Manichaeism is, uh, sounds very similar. Um, it says this is heretical in part because it postulates more than one God. Um, and two, in the beginning, there was only God. Uh, evil, therefore, could have been, could have entered the world only afterward. Um, so these are the problems with it. Um, there was not, evil was, is not eternal, in other words. There was only God, and evil came after God. God did, God, evil did not exist before God did. Um, now, the person that is credited with this, is, his name is uh, Manny. He lived from 216 to 276. It says Manny was a Persian or Mesopotamian. Although Manichaeism sometimes borrowed Christian elements as well as Zoroastrism, Hebrew, and even eventually Buddhist elements, Manichaeism was not really a Christian sect and its doctrines therefore should be classed as paganism rather than heresy, but it was an important force in the third and fourth centuries when it was usually illegal and competed with Christianity, uh, with which some people tried to combine it. And I, I see Manichaeism uh, as kind of just an offshoot of, uh, of the others that we, we mentioned earlier, the uh, Gnosticism, Docetism, uh, Marcionism, they all have the same element that the material world is evil and therefore the material world, uh, Jesus could not have been human. He couldn't have any material qualities to him. Um, now we got in the third century Origenism. Origen is a quite of a, a famous, uh, uh, what do we call a church father that from the third century. The career of Origen is one of the most uh, unusual in Christian history. He dedicated himself to defending attacks on Christianity from paganism, Judaism, and Christian heresies. His apologetic book against Celsus remains a classic piece of Christian literature. Despite his defense of orthodoxy, Origen developed several heretical doctrines that were eventually condemned. His most notable deviant teaching involved the preexistence of human souls. Uh, the subordination of the son to the father and universalism. Uh, okay, these are all separate issues here. Let, let me take them one at a time. Preexistence of human souls. Um, well, that a group that makes me think of that today would be Mormons. Mormons believe in the preexistence of human souls. Um, also, I would say that would also apply to uh, in uh, Buddhist, Buddhism and reincarnation, that souls are eternal, they've always existed, and they're going through this continuous process of, of uh, reincarnation. Um, that's not in, it's not in the Bible, it's not part of normal Christianity. Uh, the subordination of the son to the father, uh, well, He's not saying the subordination of the Son to the Father in the respect that, that I would agree. I, I agree that Jesus, uh, it said in that, that verse I read in the very beginning, uh, what was that? Uh, let me see if it's still here. Uh, oh yeah, Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Let me read this again. Referring to Jesus says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, so in other words, if you're equal with God, you have to be God. And verse seven, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and, and was made the likeness of men. So it said he made himself of no reputation. He, he willingly made himself a servant. Um, it wasn't that he was uh, a subordinate to God by nature. And that's the problem with this, uh, this teaching here is that um, Origen is thinking that throughout eternity, Jesus is subordinate. The son is subordinate to the father, but uh, that's not the case. He took on uh, this uh, subordination uh, in order to become this, this, the, the son, the God, the savior of God, the servant. Um, now, universalism is the idea that 
everybody gets saved. So Origen introduced the idea that everybody gets to go to heaven. And now I've made uh, I made uh, a video against it. Uh, I forgot what the title is, but like debunking universalism or something. So you can go watch that video if, if you like for more a thorough teaching on it. But there are clearly, scriptures tells us clearly that there are two groups of people. It says those who believe on Jesus are not condemned. Those who believe it not are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Um, they, they, whoever believe in the Son uh, uh, is uh, not condemned. Whoever believe not the Son, if I'm not quoting it exactly right, but we see there are these two groups of people, the condemned, the lost, and those who perish. In, in first, look at uh, John 3.16, for example. In the beginning was the Word, the word was with God and the word was God. I'm sorry, that's, that's John 1, 1 through 3. Um, uh, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we see two classes of people here. One group, group of people will perish and the other group of people have everlasting life. Uh, we could go on and on citing examples saying that there are definitely two groups of people. One group's perish and that perish, you know, uh, to me, uh, I, I believe that they perish in hell, but they certainly do not perish and then all of a sudden get uh, get uh, uh, everlasting life as, as a universalist would believe. So there definitely are some people who will not be in heaven. So universalism could not be true and it also takes the need away for even believing in jesus why believe in jesus why is there a need for jesus to die for our sins why is there a need for us to put our faith in jesus if everybody gets to go to heaven anyway so uh, origin is uh it's claimed that he is guilty of, of believing in universalism um now, we've got another term here called dynamic monarchianism or Sibelianism or modalism. Uh, I prefer to call it modalism. Uh, and it is the, the basically the view that um, in order to protect the uh, doctrine of um, monotheism, that we cannot have uh, a trinity. That's what modalism says. You cannot have three distinct persons because that would mean that you are a polytheist. You're believing in three gods. And so in order to explain it uh, in a way that protects monotheism, the modalists say that, yes, we have one God. And, and uh, he just simply changes modes of operation. Thus the word modalism. Uh, sometimes he'll put on a mask uh, of the son. Sometimes he'll put on a mask of the father. Sometimes he wears a mask of the Holy Spirit. So he operates in three different modes, but it's one person just changing modes of operation. Um, that way, uh, they believe that monotheism is protected and they, they can't be confused uh, or uh, uh, charged with polytheism. Um, but I don't hold to modalism i i do think that they 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 say that uh, jesus christ is eternal god almighty uh, and yet they don't believe that the three persons exist simultaneously they believe that he exists in one form at a time that's modalism and that was decreed uh, a heresy uh, numerous times throughout church history uh, the, so that's uh, the problem with modalism, though, is that um, um, it's it's easily debunked in the scriptures. Even, even though if I was to defend modalism with the scriptures, I could give you dozens of verses that a modalist would use to say, see, uh, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. So they take that to mean uh, the Father and the Son are one and the same. Uh, but 
I would take that to mean um, the Father and the Son are of one substance. They're both both equally God. Uh, that's how the church as a whole considers it. The, the, G, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of one substance or one essence, not this, just the same person. Um, there are just too many examples in the Bible where we find where Jesus is, is uh, for example, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. How can they be one, just one, if there's two of them? The Father sitting on the throne and Jesus sitting on his right hand side on, on his throne. Uh, Jesus is calling out to the Father from the cross, uh, why have you forsaken me? I mean, the, the examples could go on and on. The, uh, the, the baptism of Jesus, you have Jesus there in the water being baptized. You have the Father speaking, saying, this is my beloved Son. And you have the Holy Spirit uh, descending in the manner of a dove. You have all three persons, distinct persons uh, of the Godhead present at the same time and place. So these things to me debunk modalism, but um, uh, they do give Jesus credit for being eternal God Almighty. They do not consider him to be a creature as, as they would in Arianism or, or uh, adoptionism. Um, let me see. Uh, the group, the modern group that uh, can be cited that would hold to modalism today are these people, we, they refer to themselves as oneness Pentecostals. So if you ever go to a Pentecostal church that, that is uh, oneness, that means they believe in the oneness of God, not the triunity of God. That, that, that Jesus is the son. Jesus is the Father. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's the one as Pentecostals. Another problem with one as Pentecostals, I believe that they, they believe in baptismal regeneration uh, and that uh, you only get sa saved when you get wet and that when you truly get saved, that uh, there you must have the signs of speaking in tongues as a sign that you truly did I get baptized in the Holy Spirit. So there's a lot of problems with one of one is Pentecostalism. Uh, let me see if I want to go any further. Okay. Well, let me see. I think uh, I only want to go for an hour, so I better save a few minutes for uh, the conclusion here and the offer of salvation. Um, so what we're going to do is well, there's a lot more of these heresies that I'm going to be going through. It'll probably take me at least two or three or four of these studies to complete this. Uh, but I want you to see that these heresies happened not only in the first century, even during the times of the apostles, um, but in the second century and third centuries, these, these uh, heresies were springing up. And, and uh, many of them are still common today. Uh, the worst of all, of course, are the Judaizers, the legalists, and today we would call them the Lordship Salvationists. <laughs> uh, that gets me to the invitation of salvation. And if, if you're, this is, maybe you're stumbled on this, you find it interesting, uh, but you really have never um, studied the Bible, you never learned what the Bible says about salvation. Salvation means that you're saved from condemnation and instead you receive eternal life in heaven. Uh, that's what being saved means. And in other words, it means you get to go to heaven. So the question I guess I would ask you is, are you interested in going to heaven? Do you want to go to heaven? That might sound like a strange question. It seems like everybody would want to go to heaven, but some people say, well, I don't believe there is a heaven or a hell. Or some people say, no, I'd rather go to hell. That's where my friends are going to be. We'll, we'll have a big party there. But here's an announcement for you. The party in hell was canceled due to the fire. So uh, I hope that even if you say now, I'm not interested in going to heaven, I'm going to tell you what you need to do. What must you do so you can go to heaven? In case someday you say, hey, I really do want to go to heaven now, but I don't know how. 
So what is required of you if you want to go to heaven? The problem is that almost all the people in the world today, in fact, almost all the people who have ever lived, have been believing a lie from the devil. It started in the Garden of Eden, and it's proceeded all through all the religions of the world throughout history. And that is that uh, somehow man doesn't need God. Instead, he can do it on his own. He can eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then he can learn what's right and wrong, and he can make his own effort and do good, and just through, through his own efforts, he can please God and be acceptable and go to heaven. This is what uh, we would call the, the merit system. That if you go to heaven, it's determined by personal merit. The good people get to go to heaven. The bad people go to hell. Uh, but there's a lot of problems with that. One, how good do you have to be? And how, or how bad do you have to be to go to hell? Um, but not only is that a philosophical problem, but we also find in the Bible that it says that's not God's way. It says it's, it, God's way is, is not for you to establish your own righteousness and present yourself to God and say, look how good I am. I deserve heaven, don't I? No, you've got to reject that. The Bible said God's way is, is through humility. We, uh, we um, rely on Jesus. In other words, we must come to the conclusion that we're in a hopeless, hopeless situation that we cannot get to heaven through personal effort. And therefore, we need to be saved. We need someone to intervene on our behalf. And that's what God has done. God saw that our situation was hopeless because in order for us to satisfy his criteria for going to heaven, you'd have to be perfect. And the, the Bible says that um, we all fall short of the glory of God. So let's say this level here is the glory of God. That's perfection. Jesus Christ set the standard. He lived a perfect, sinless life and says, this is the bar that you've got to cross. And so you strive, you join religions, you do good works, you be, you're trying to be a good person, and you're going to always fall short because Jesus told his apostles it was impossible. They said, How is it possible for anyone to be saved? He said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So I want you to come to the understanding and the conclusion that uh, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. None of us can go before God and say, I've been perfect. I've never sinned. If we, Once you understand that, you can understand your need to be saved. Your need for God to help you, to God to grant you grace. And that's what the Bible says that we, we is offered to us. Uh, the Bible says the gospel, which is a Greek word that means good news, the gospel is simply that Jesus offers each one of us salvation, eternal life in heaven as a free gift. It says we're saved by grace, by the grace of God, because God is gracious to us. Uh, we receive salvation when we put our faith in Jesus we get the gift of salvation. Now, that means that uh, it, it's, it's not based upon the works that you do. It's based upon the works that Jesus did. Jesus lived a perfect son of his life. And because I believe in Jesus and I trust him, his perfection is credited to my account. Isn't that wonderful? It, it's imputed. His righteousness is imputed to me. So I get credit for his righteousness. All my sins were charged against Jesus. So it was an exchange. My sins were put on him. His righteousness was put on me. We traded places. That's how much Jesus loved me. And he loves you. Um, the Bible says, God demonstrated his love for us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's That just shows you how much God loves us. That he would be willing to trade places. He'll give you his righteousness and he takes your sins. And he did that as he died on the cross and he, he did die and he was buried. But he predicted that he would die and be buried, but raised to life again on the third day. And he, he did that. He raised himself back to life. And it's true. 
because he, he walked among uh, 500 witnesses for 40 days after his resurrection. He was raised bodily and they, they touched him. They ate with him. They talked with him. They saw him. The resurrection is the proof that gives me confidence that my faith in Jesus is justified. So Jesus says that, uh, let me use this as an illustration here. See this icon. He's reaching out. He, the Bible says he doesn't desire that any of us should perish. He wants to take each one of us up to heaven. And you need to trust him to go to heaven. And he says that uh, he holds you in the palm of his hand. It's like he's reaching out to me. And when I embrace him, he's got me in the palm of his hand. And he said, he will never leave me or forsake me. No one can pluck me out of his hand. So not only did he promise me eternal life in heaven because of my faith in him, he promised me it's irrevocable, it's irreversible. I never have to worry about losing my salvation. So that's the good news. That's the gospel. And it's really simple to understand. Jesus offers you eternal life in heaven as a free gift if you'll trust him completely. I hope you'll do that now. I hope you'll join me nightly for these live broadcasts every night, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.